بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, I begin by thanking uh, Brother Shahran for the kind words uh, Now when you bring such, such uh, good words that means you raise the expectation that is always the strategy uh, to raise those expectations and may Allah make us young. Uh, more than the husn of them that you have on us and may Allah always make us do what is good for our uh, religion and Brother Shahran mashallah has been very active and I think this is uh, something commendable for people like IT to organize such an online classes with various uh, disciplines and areas uh, may Allah keep uh, the efforts going inshallah now I'll be sharing with you something on fit for economists for this uh, uh, seventh series. Now, what I'm going to share with you has a little bit of digression from what we discussed in the class, uh, because given the diverse background, I thought of uh, you know uh, making it address the audience that we have um, and who are participating in this uh, uh, session. So, my outline basically would be we'll be looking at the class modules that I'll be discussing for these seven uh, sessions. And then we'll focus on module one, uh, which is about the introduction to fit for economists for this session. And then we'll look, uh, of course, what this module one entails, uh, like classification of Sharia, concept and definition of fiqh, classification of fiqh and relationship between fiqh, akhlaq, and uh, atawheid. Because this is very fundamental that for later discussion. Huh? Bro, can you speak a bit higher? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> there is a bit of volume. <laughs> okay, the volume is low. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see how to increase. No, sorry, sorry. no you're so the from your voice, your own voice. Yeah, not not the from computer. My own voice, but is the volume clear now? Because no, my side is okay. Yeah? What about uh, others? Can I hear from others? How is the volume? Hello. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Can you can you hear maybe, me? Other? Maybe through time you will speak louder. Maybe they're just starting. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So anyways, so then I'll go. I'll continue. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the reminder. Yeah. So these are some of the classes that we'll have for these seven weeks. Uh, today, 11th of August, we have this introduction. Then we have uh, fifth and the market, which is inshallah next week. Then fifth and contractual relations. Then we have fake and factors of production, fake and economic agents. The sixth session will be on fake and wealth distribution. And then in the seventh session, we'll be discussing some contemporary issues on fake for uh, economists. So these are the sessions that we'll be, inshallah, dealing with. So the learning outcome for today, we expect, inshallah, at the end of this session, uh, we should be able to explain and appreciate the need for fit for economies, its concepts and definition. We should be able to refresh our knowledge on the relationships between Islam and Sharia. And we should be able to appreciate the classification of Sharia and, and fiqh. Now, way forward, if you are to talk about fiqh, then you need first to talk talk about an Islam and a Sharia uh, because these are very fundamental and related fiqh. Now, what is Al-Islam? Uh, without going into detail, you know that Al-Islam is the deen. And I'm using this word deen very specifically. I did not use the word religion because there's a difference between a deen and religion because uh, religion normally, you go to the definition, they refer it to individuals' uh, private practices. But we know that a deen, by definition in Islam, encompasses all spheres of our life. So Islam is a deen which is sent to all prophets. In fact, all messengers and prophets of Allah, their deen is called al-Islam. Uh, in other words, the deen of Adam alayhi salam, the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, the deen of Ibrahim, the deen of Isa, Musa, all these messengers and prophets, their deen is al-Islam. Now, what's the difference then between the Islam of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, the Islam of Adam, and the Islam of Musa? So, the variations among this al-Islam is the Sharia. 
because uh, the Sharia that is sent to the different messengers and prophets differ from one prophet to the other. Um, but Alhamdulillah, being the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Sharia is considered very, very comprehensive. And the Sharia is considered very accommodating, very moderate, because our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is considered as Rahmatan Lil Alameen. As a typical example, in the early generations, uh, there, some of them are given very harsh Sharia. Uh, take, for example, the Jews, if they have to do Tawbah, they had to kill themselves. Hmm? Hmm? So they had to kill themselves in Surah Al-Baqarah. And uh, so, for the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because it's Rahmat in the Alameen, our Tawbah is simply, you just refrain from being those sins and ask sincere Tawbah from Allah, and that is forgiven. So there are a lot of examples we can give. Uh, but since the focus is on fiqh, so I will continue. So basically, a Sharia is a guidance to us in all aspects of our life, whether it's private, public, individual, social, spiritual and material, including economics that we are about to discuss. Now, then what are those classifications of Sharia? And this is very, very fundamental, where we see the relationship uh, between uh, al-fiqh, al-akhlaq, and al-tawheed in this classification. So a scholar says that a Sharia is generally classified into these three areas, al-tawheed, al-akhlaq, and al-fiqh. Uh, now we begin by this word, Tawheed, and then we we'll follow by Al-Akhlaq, then Al-Fiqh. And in the end, I will try to link the relationship between the three. Because unfortunately today, we tend to have the tendency of dichotomizing between these three, especially when we deal in the areas of Mu'amalat. In our Islamic banking and finance, we just focus on the Fiqh, devoid of Al-Akhlaq and Tawheed. And today I will argue that for a good mu'amalat, for a good sharia, you need to take them as a package, hmm? rather than looking at each of them in isolation. Now, what is a tawheed? Uh, many people, they define a tawheed as the unity of God, a oneness of God. To me, I think this definition is very static. Hmm? It follows definitions of other religions, all things that Allah created God in six days. And so if it's the Christian, they say, so on Sunday, Allah had to rest. Uh, so as if uh, there is no relationship between Allah and their day-to-day -day life, since he has created the earth, so he left the earth to run on remote control. And the same thing we see also with uh, the Jewish religion, where uh, they say Saturday is a resting day. So Allah also rests on Saturday. But in Islam, our definition is a little bit different because to us, one of the sifat of Allah is al-hayyu. That means Allah is actively involved in our activities every second and from the day we are born until our death. Allah is involved in our life. Therefore, at tawheed uh, the root word for at tawheed is wahada. And wahada in Arabic means the process of unification. Uh, it is from the Arabic saf, from the zan of the word uh, fa'ala. Hmm? Fa'ala, usually anything that is related to fa'ala, the masdah or the noun is taf'il. Tahara, tadhir, jahaza, tajhiz. So these are process of unification. Now the question is, what is that source and destiny of your unification? From where are you unifying and towards what you are unifying? And we know that our unification, the source, the ultimate source is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is our beginning and he is our end. Huh? Uh, like you say, usually in the Asma'ullah al husna hmm? So since Allah is the beginning and He is the end, so all the process of unification must go, must go towards this 
one source, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What then is it that we unify? We unify our thoughts, we unify our words, and we unify our action towards this one source. And you see, and that's very interesting. When you talk about Tawheed, it means it's not just about our action in fiqh, but it is also about our thought, uh, and it's also about our words, uh, and whatever is, you know, going inside us, we have to unify it towards that one source. Now, how do we unify our thoughts? How do we unify our action? How do we unify our words towards this one source? Normally, you find other Muslims, they tend to have that unity when they have a big bang in their lives. Uh, for example, they miss an accident. In that time, you find everybody's crying, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. You find all the words, the action and thoughts are in unison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if they have received good news, huh? so you find them, alhamdulillah, everything is towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, it's something that comes off and on. But what Islam requires is that for uh, a, a good tawhid, a genuine tawhid, that process has to be frequent. That means the more conscious you are towards Allah, that frequency of consciousness towards Allah, the more it is, the more your tawheed uh, is more closer to that uh, unification towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, what we require here is that if you have that process of unification constantly, meaning if you see a situation, you remember Allah. You are happy, you remember Allah. You are in difficulty, you remember Allah. You see another Muslim in difficulty, you remember Allah. Uh, you are cornered in a situation where you have no ways out, you remember Allah. So this kind of a frequent remembrance to Allah, you, you know, remember your sins, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you see your children in front of you, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The name you see, you remember Allah. If this remembrance is frequent and in your tongue this afkar is frequent, then we say you are more closer to this meaning of process of unification in your tawheed. Now, how does this translate in economics? Because from day to day, you know, we interact in our economic activities in the market, in our working place as managers. Uh, we interact as sellers and buyers, we interact as consumers in different capacities. Now, if there is a gap between your tawheed and your activities, then you think that the immediate person whom you are responsible and accountable to is your supervisor. But if your tawheed is very frequent and strong, and the consciousness is strong in you, you don't need an immediate supervisor all the time you recognize that your ultimate responsibility and accountability lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, you are constantly involved in that process of unification called at-tawheed. Now, the second classification of Sharia is called al-akhlaq. Now, al-Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, in his Ihya al muddin he says human beings uh, basically, whether you're a father, mother, a child, or anybody, and according to him, even Muslims and non-Muslims, when they are born, they are born with two wares, huh? hardware and software. And the hardware is called khalqun, huh? this is the hardware. Huh? You have the body, you have the leg, you have the head, huh? all this hardware. But then inside you also, you have a software, which he calls khurqun. And the plural is akhlaq. Now, this software, which is born, you know, with every individual, it has both negative and positive aspects. In other words, since our focus is in the software, you are born with a quality of being good and bad, a quality of love and hate, a quality of humility and arrogance, 
a quality of being sincere and insincere. All these are born inside you. These are innate quality, according to Imam Al Ghazali, rahimahullah. And this akhlaq, which we call morality, are abstract concepts. You cannot see love. You cannot see hate. You cannot see anger. All these have to be expressed. People have to express them. So when they become manifest, when they are expressed, they are called adab or ethics. And so today you find most of our focus is on ethics. Huh? How to eat, how to talk to the people. Huh? Even our entire governance in organizations, whether they are banking, they are finance, any firm, the focus is on ethics. That means the outer side of this morality. So people don't look at what the software is. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that a person may act ethically, outwardly, but that action may not necessarily come from their software. Hmm? Uh, for example, like somebody was saying, in other countries, they say don't eat chewing gum. But when they cross over to Johor, it's okay to eat chewing gum. No. In other Islamic universities, they will wear hijab to do because the university says wear hijab. But when they leave the university, they go outside, they think hijab is not necessary. Because they are following that outward, that ethical, that adept, but the software has not been developed to translate into this adept or ethics. So a good ethics, good adept, is one which comes from a good software. In other words, it remains constant. But of course, the best akhlaq is that of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the Quran describes in him in Surah Al-Qalam and says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You have the best software. That's why our Prophet وسلم, when he wakes up every morning, he makes a dua to Allah. He says, Allahumma kama hassante khalqi, hassin khuluqi. Hmm? Allah, the way you have made my software good, and another way, kama ahsante khalqi, hassin khuluqi. The way you made my soft hardware good, ya Allah also make my software good. So in other words, we need to inculcate what we call good akhlaq. Now, what is the problem? Why are people not developing this good akhlaq? Now, our scholars of ethics say there's something called the diseases of the heart, or amrad al-qalm. And at the top of this amrad al-qalm is arrogance, kibriya. Now, what is arrogance? What is kibriya? Uh, Iblis gives us the translation. Huh? The need of the shaitan gives us the translation of arrogance. When he was told to portray before Adam, he says, I will not do it. Then Allah asks him and says, why you do not want to prostrate uh, uh, to Adam? He says, Ana khayrun min. I am better than him. So usually arrogant people, they have that tendency of saying, I'm better than others. In fact, Imam al-Ghazali says that if you meet a brother, Muslim brother or sister, and then you spoke inside yourself and say, ha, my English is better than her English. Hmm? Even if you don't pronounce it openly, but inside you, you speak to yourself, he says you have terminal arrogance. Uh, it's just like terminal cancer. Hmm? And you need to get rid of that. So arrogance will create showing off, will create the envy, and will create things like anger. These are all the diseases of the heart, which we must purify so that we inculcate good akhlaq like humility, contentment, and kindness. And since the focus of this lecture is on fit, so I will not focus more on how to, um, to purify, on the process of purification of the heart. And this will be another uh, subject some other days, inshallah. But suffice it to say that uh, to inculcate good akhlaq, we need to get rid of those diseases of the heart and then inculcate good akhlaq. 
But let me make some bit of footnote here. When the scholars of ethics say it is the diseases of the heart, they mean something which becomes part and parcel of your personality. But things that are off and on are not considered as diseases of the heart because they are natural. For example, a lady goes to the market to buy, you know, her bracelets, uh, golden ring. Of course, you cannot tell that this lady should not show off to her, you know, other friends. Of course, she needs to show off and say, oh, you see, I have these nice uh, bracelets, I have these nice gifts. So it is natural for people to show off. And it is natural for them to be angry off and on. And it is natural sometimes uh, for them to be a little bit arrogant you know, here and there. But once it becomes part of your personality, it becomes part, a trait to your personality, then it becomes a sickness. When you're always angry, then it's a sickness. If people associate you with arrogance, which is part of your personality, then it's a sickness. If whenever people see you, they remember people who show off, then it's a problem, huh? then it's a sickness, okay? So for it to be a, a disease, it has to be a, a trait of your personality. Now we'll move on to the next, uh, mashallah, am I? Okay, I'm trying to see, okay, the time. Okay, good, so I'm still, I'm still okay. Uh, before the, the chairperson starts start telling me, okay, you have to wind up, okay. So we move on to al-fiqh. Now al-fiqh has a profound meaning of understanding. It's, it literally means profound understanding. And over time this term al-fiqh has been confined today only to mean Islamic law. This has pros and cons. Uh, later we'll see what the pros and the cons are. And then, over the years, we have seen that the classification of fiqh has increased beyond the traditional four classification, which later I will share with you. And this also includes fiqh for economies. Now, what is the basic meaning, the original meaning of fiqh? We find it in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, uh, which I'm sure many of you have memorized, which comes in Ibn Majah. The hadith says, that man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihahu fi ad-deen. When Allah wills good for a person, uh, when he wants to khayr, something good for you, then he gives you a profound understanding. He gives you a deeper understanding of your deen, of your religion. So this word, deeper understanding in all its various aspects, is what we call fiqh. That is why our previous scholars are called fuqaha because they only don't deal with one aspect of rulings, but they also deal with psychological aspects, they deal with social aspects, they deal with economic aspects. In fact, they were encyclopedia, those fuqaha. Uh, so fiqh was something which was, you know, very broad huh, in its understanding. That's why we find also in one hadith of the Prophet وسلم, when he told Ibn Abbas, the Prophet went to the toilet, and when he came back, he found somebody gave him water to perform wudu. Then he asked, he says, who put this water for me? They said, oh, Ya Rasulullah, it's Ibn Abbas. Then again, he make a dua and says, Ya Rab, you give a profound understanding of being to Ibn Abbas. And today, really, you read about Ibn Abbas in terms of hadith that he relates, uh, in terms of tafsir, in terms of a lot of things, mashallah. The understanding of this deen on the part of Ibn Abbas is very profound in a lot of things, and he became a main reference for the companions of the Prophet. So you can see that from the hadith, fiqh was not just rulings, but it was more broad than this word ruling. Huh? So, but of course, over the years now, we see that many fifth schools or fifth books have tried to give a precise definition of fiqh. But what caught my eyes is a definition by an Imam of Hanifa, and this is from uh, Wahab al-Zuhaili. He says, an Imam of Hanifa, rahimahullah, he says, fiqh is 
ma'rifatun nafs ma'laha wa ma'aleha. And this is very beautiful. That any individual, if you know what is due for you and upon you, in other words, you know your rights and obligations, whether those rights are related to your religion, those rights and obligations are related to your ethics, related to your morality, related to your practices, this is fiqh. In other words, that profound understanding of what is your rights and obligation in all spheres of your life, this is fiqh, according to Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. In other words, this includes those three areas that we had discussed earlier, the area of Aqeedah, Tawheed, the area of uh, Al-Akhlaq, and the area of Al-Fiqh. But a more precise definition we find is from Al-Imam al-Shafi, where many scholars today, they use a shafi definition, where to him, al-fiqh is something which is knowledge of practical Sharia ruling that is derived from their detailed sources. So by knowledge, he means knowledge that can be definitive, uh, like knowledge in things of ibadat, salah, siyam, these are definite things, or knowledge that can be interpreted from our ishtihad. Huh? And then also, this knowledge has to be practical. It has to be related to the practices of the mukallaf. Mukallaf are those who are responsible for their practices. And then Sharia rulings on these practices. And by al-muqtasab, or derived, here he means through observation and ishtihad. Hmm? Uh, in other words, if you observe something and you come up with an interpretation of what you observe religiously, then it becomes fiqh. Or if you do ishtihad through a thorough research on that issue, it also becomes fiqh. Therefore, by definition, then all our books that involve, uh, you know, Islamization, ishtihad, etc., then it falls under this category of fiqh so long as there is ishtihad on them. So the detailed sources are basically the Quran and Sunnah according to him, and then Ijma, and then al -Qiyas. Now, from this perspective, we could look at him that, for you to come up with fiqh, which is an output, you need to have the primary sources of the Sharia. That is the Quran and a Sunnah. And through Quran and Sunnah, we have to do Ijtihad using all the tools of Usul fiqh. What are those tools? Tools like Qiyas, uh, tools like uh, istihsan, tools like maqasid al-sharia, and I'm sure many of you learned it. So from ishtihad and using those tools, then you come up with a new knowledge called al-fiqh. Hmm? And so basically from this definition, we have learned that we need a primary source, we need a methodology in order to produce our al-fiqh. So the sources have to be revealed sources, Quran and Sunnah, the methodology, you need to be well acquainted with it. You need to be a good scholar who does good ijtihad, and then you come up with the fact. But according to Wahb al-Zuhayli, he says, uh, many scholars today tend to be taqlidiyin. That means they follow what other scholars have done, and the amount of ijtihad food is relatively small. Okay? Now, I have another 10 minutes, 15 before I open up. I'm following my time, uh, Brother Shaharan. Inshallah, I will uh, finish actually in time. Now, what are the classification of fiqh? These are the classification of fiqh we have. Fiqh al ibadat And these are fiqh related to matters of prayers, uh, fasting, uh, zakah, etc. Then al uh practical uh, fiqh related to uh, family institutions, things like marriage, divorce, rights of the children, rights of husbands and wives, etc. Then al-jinayat is fiqh related to what they say, um, uh, criminal law. Huh? And at the top of the agenda is al-hudud. Huh? Uh, people talk about hudud or the capital punishment. Uh, and in Sharia, there are five capital punishments that has been agreed upon, but there are differences of opinion of scholars on the sixth and the seventh. Uh, the first one is called Aridda, 
apostasy. And then we have Qisas, which is the second. Uh, that means if you kill somebody intentionally, then you have to pay with your life. And thirdly is a zina, adultery. And then you have, uh, the fourth is a sarifa, which is um, a robbery or theft. And the final one is called al-qadr, al-qadr, which is slender. Uh, when you slender, these are five agreed upon. But of course, people differ on the sixth and seven, uh, which is basically what they call hirata, uh, meaning when you create a kind of uh, uh, social unrest, whether this could be considered as hudud um, or not. Okay. Then our focus, inshallah, will be on al muamalat, which are things related to a business, uh, things related to business. So that will be our focus. Now, today we have also other categories of fiqh, and you find a lot of categories. For example, you have things like contemporary fiqh, al fiqh al muasir. You have fiqh al mara'a, fiqh for women specifically. You have minority fiqh, uh, fiqh for Muslims living in uh, majority non Muslim countries. They are considered as minority. And uh, believe me, this fiqh is very, very tough because their situation. Uh, is really mind-boggling, and I had a chance to have a lot of sessions with the brothers uh, who are in the UK, uh, we met in Cape Town, South Africa, and a lot of issues that they raised on fiqh were really challenging. Mm -hmm. And then comparative fiqh, we have uh, fiqh of the different mabahid, and then of course we have our fiqh for economists, that means fiqh that address the needs of uh, economists. Uh, uh, for which uh, the majority of you are in that group of fiqh for uh, economists. Uh, moving forward now, we we'll look at the relationship between al-fiqh, al-akhlaq, and al-tawheed. And the reason why I bring this discussion is because uh, today, as I told you, whenever people talk about al-mu'amalat, uh, particularly in our transactions involving finance, banking, economics, uh, we tend to compartmentalize our understanding and think that uh, we only need to focus on the contractual matter, uh, things related to belief, tawheed, things related to morality, akhlaq, does not apply. So I will give you a few examples to show that these are really very, very fundamental. Now, I focus on two scenarios. The first scenario is I focus on what we call things that are forbidden for their own sake. Huh? And uh, the Arabic word is, they say, al-muharramu lidhatihi. Sometimes they use the word haram or al-haram lidhatihi. Uh, things that, in essence, they are haram. Huh? Uh, for example, wine is haram in essence, and pig is haram in essence. Okay? And this is very, very fundamental. And then the second category later, which I will show you, is called Al-Muharram al -ghayrihi. It has been prohibited, not in essence, but because of the means of acquiring them. It's prohibited. So the first one is they're prohibited because, in essence, they are not allowed for us to, to use them. And I give two examples, wine and pig or swine. Now, this thing or these elements embodies all those three aspects that we talk about. Tawheed, uh, and Tuk. Now, if somebody tells you, why is being prohibited? Okay. Now, the question is, do you have to wait for the rationality of why it is prohibited so that you don't believe that it is prohibited? I don't think this is how it works, all right? Regardless of the rationality, because Allah says it is prohibited, then the most fundamental part is your aqidah to say it is hard because it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is that aqidah part. Hmm? And khamr also the same. Regardless of what the rationale is, you just say it is haram. And this is what also the Quran says, right? 
وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قال الله رسول أمرا أن يكون لهم خيرا في أمرهم If Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decides on something and say this is halal, this is haram, you have no choice. You have to submit. Huh? So this is part of the aqidah. However, that's a very interesting part, that sometimes out of barura, and you see, mark the words I'm using, I'm using the word barura, and this is very specific word. Huh? And later we'll see in the second case, I don't use the word barura which unfortunately many scholars today they use when they want to justify the means they use the word barura which is not right so out of barura out of necessity you are in a war situation you are in famine you are in a difficult situation where you have no way out except to eat the pig now these three elements become very very fundamental one thing is you are akira the tawheed how are you going to eat that pig what is it that is going inside your heart about eating that pig are you happy to eat that pig or you reach a level where you say the Arab, if there was a choice for dying i just want to die and not to eat the pig have you reached that level where you are eating with such difficulty that as if your soul is coming out because you have a strong belief in Allah that Ya Rab, this is something haram and I have no choice. Please mark what I'm saying is very, very fundamental because later we'll share the same when we go to the second example. You feel so bad that you're eating the pig. Then secondly, what other do you use to eat that pig? How do you behave yourself in eating that pig? Are you going to, you know, organize a very nice table, setting lights and all this? Or your behavior towards that pig that kind of humility, that kind of what that you exercise has a very fundamental role. And thirdly, the fifth, fifth of Baruriyat, huh? which says, Barura to Qadr Baqadriha. Barura is on the limit to the extent of that Barura. Are you going to extend that Barura and enjoy eating this thing? Or you confine yourself to the darura until Allah brings out, bring you out of the problem. That is why in Quran, in Surah Al-Taraq, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا If you really sincerely fear Allah, your aqidah is so strong, you know that, Ya Rabbi, I am compelled under an extreme and severe circumstance to eat this thing, then Allah Allah will bring you, will open the door. Wallahi, you will never, you know, you will never take a long time in this situation. You will never sustain it. Immediately Allah will give you the way out. Because your near is so mukhlis, and the way you are behaving, your akhlaq, and you are within the fiqh of this marura. Now let us go to the second example. I'm left with five minutes or so. The second example is Al Muharram Lagayrihi. And I give example of money, cash, gold. Hmm? And here I'm more particularly concerned about how we use our money. And I'm sure the thing that comes at the back of your mind is riba. And later we'll see also that comes to your mind is gharar. So normally this means of acquiring wealth, if it is haram, it involves gharar. It is the consequence, because of the consequences that the Sharia prohibits it. In other words, gharar, why is gharar prohibited? Because gharar leads to disputes among people. So let's say the money involves riba. 
it involves riba okay and i'll give let me give you an example a friend sends to me you know on uh, whatsapp message yesterday and i was answering that whatsapp message the friend is contributing to what in malaysia they call it epf or social security funds huh? Uh, funds that we contribute after retirement. Contribution comes from the employer, from the employee, sometimes also the government contributes. And you save that money after retirement, you collect that money. So this brother happens to be in minority Muslim countries. That means the entire system is conventional. So the brother asked me and say, our money is being invested in riba. So what should we do? Okay, that means the means of acquiring this money is already haram. Okay, but the capital is okay, but only the excess that they get is haram. Another typical case I'll give you is, there's another brother who went to study abroad, doing his MBA. After three semesters, he could get the scholarship. In the last semester, he had a problem. He had no money but the university says we will give you loan to complete your study but we will take interest we'll charge interest riba. now here the sharia uses the word haja needs not darura needs you have a need to fulfill now if you are compelled in that situation where you have no other way, then you need also to exercise that hajjah within that limit in which you are forced to. In other words, what is the attitude that you have adopted in terms of your relationship with Allah? What is the akhlaq in which you have adopted? And what is the fiqh? So the difficulty we have today is that People tend to enjoy darura. Somebody is taking money, which is riba, involved in disguised riba, but is giving justification of maslaha, justification of darura. Why? Because that person is only looking at the contractual aspects. He's forgetting that tawhid is involved and forgetting that akhlaq is also involved. And these are very, very fundamental concepts the moment we talk about the relationship between al-fiqh, akhlaq, and al-tawheed. Therefore, in conclusion, I have one or two minutes left, that al-fiqh must be defined from its basic meaning to allow flexibility and dynamism. And then, fiqh literacy and dynamism of jihad are very fundamental for the progress of the Ummah. And finally, I say that for us to have a broad meaning of al-fiqh, then we do not need to isolate fiqh from our aqidah and from our akhlaq, and the two go together. And later when we discuss the second session next week, inshallah, I will show you how fundamental those concepts are in practice when we apply them to economics, banking, and finance. And thank you very much for listening. I surpassed at least one minute, and Jazakumullah khair. Now I'll be waiting for your questions and answers. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much, Prof. I think it's a very good uh, starting uh, point for all of us to continue with the discussion. Uh, we welcome uh, all questions uh, from the brothers and sisters. Uh, one simple comment from Brother Yusuf Kaji. Mm. Uh, is hijab head cover for women being made a fraud? Should we all male and female be modestly, simple, not showing aura, and well behave? Okay, I think that's a good question. Uh, based on the hadith of the Prophet uh, which uh, many of you I'm sure memorized, uh, they call it the Hadith of Asma, where the Prophet says uh, a lady should cover all her body except uh, the things which are apparent to her. 
uh, where she can uh, show, for example, she needs her hand to be exposed because she has to work, and her leg because, and her face, uh, but her entire body should be uh, covered. The other second hadith, which is very interesting, is once this blind man in the Quran, his name is Abdullah ibn Maktoum, uh, he came to visit the Prophet and the Prophet was inside with Aisha Then Aisha ran up the door and asked and says, who is at the door? Then Abdullah, the blind man says, it is me, Abdullah. Then Aisha anha opened the door without her hijab because she understood that this is a blind man who cannot see. Then the Prophet wasallam, of course, he understood. He says, Aisha, who is at the door? She says, Ya Rasulullah, it's Abdullah. Then the Prophet wasallam, replied to Aisha again and says, Amawani and Tuma, are you both blind? Of course, the Prophet wasallam, knows Aisha can physically see. But by saying, are you both blind? It means he is a blind man, but you, you are not blind. That means whether there is a blind man or not a blind man, it is part and parcel of your dignity as a woman to cover, uh, regardless of whether that person sees or not. And subhanAllah, look, today with the technology, we understand that you know people can be blind on the surface, but they may not be as blind as we think. So that's why um, it is part of the modesty of a Muslim lady uh, to wear that uh, complete hijab. And equally also, it is part of the modesty of the man to cover properly. Hmm? Uh, I remember I was in the, a student in the hostel, then one brother when he was praying, he eh, was giving salah, so when he was praying, so he was just traveling down with the sarong, and then he did not cover on top of uh, his clothes, he left it empty. Then I asked the brother, I said, why are you not covering on top, why are you just covering down? He says, you did not read fiqh? I said, okay, uh, what does fiqh say? He says, fiqh says that the aura of, uh, uh, the, 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 of a man is between his knee and the navel. So I have covered this part, so what's the problem? Then I asked him a question. I said, but is this the minimum or the maximum? He says, what do you mean? I say, <laughs> the Sharia says you only cover this minimum when you don't have any other clothes in the world. This is the only clothes you have, so I ensure that it covers this part. But brother, when I open your wardrobe, mashallah, you have all this coat, uh, nice tie, nice dish. Uh, you only wear them when you go to see important people. But here is somebody who is more important than these people. You want to give that person a minimum and give to others the maximum. So it doesn't work this way. So my point here is that we also need to be modest as a Muslim men uh, to cover uh, because it's part of our deen. Huh? To have that akhlaq, yes. Uh, from Brother Asim uh, Wahla, what is the role of intention in Islamic financial transactions and contracts? Regarding the the intention. Ah, intention, ah. Yeah. Rega uh, regarding permissibility. And thus having that intention is permissible contract, and permissible contract lead impermissibility. We penalize in having that intention in Islamic contract and transaction. Okay, that's a good question. I think it's a very good question. Now, if you read the book by al Shafi'i, Rahimahullah, on al Muafaqat, he tries to address these issues of uh, intention in transaction. In fact, he comes with six cases. Huh? Uh, one case where uh, you see um, uh, somebody, uh, you know, makes an intention and he knows what his intention is, then the, that intention has effect on the contract. Because for a contract to be Sharia binding, uh, the intention has to be taken into consideration. And that's what the Hadith says. So that intention, if you're conscious about your intention, then the intention has effect. In other words, if you consume something haram and you know it is haram, then of course uh, that intention will you know, be accounted for. You'll be accounted for those intentions. 
But there are situations where people, you know, they do things and they are not aware of what it is. Uh, and uh, for this case, then intention does not apply. And these people are of two categories. One category are those who, because of their natural or innate qualities, like insane people, uh, like children, those who are sleeping, uh, these people, their intention uh, are not valid. They are not taken into consideration. But there are people who do things out of jahl, ignorance. Now, this is where Fukaha has a lot of uh, debate. Whether intention applies to this person who is not conscious, who is ignorant about such things, or the intention should apply to that kind of a person. And uh, others think that uh, there are a group of people, and it's discussed in this Ashati book on Amorha, there are a group of people who think that since that person uh, is not aware of such a thing and not aware of intention, so uh, it should not apply to him. But others say, no, still it applies. So the last part is an area of ishtihad. But the general idea is that for a valid contract, the intention must be taken into consideration, a motive. Uh, so there can never be anything without a motive. So it has to be taken into consideration. Uh, from Brother Muhammad uh, is Ishfaq. I would like to confirm my understanding that interest bearing loan become justifiable in situation of Hajjah. But what are guidelines for Hajjah? Okay, that's good. Um, you see, this is a very interesting question because you see, Hajjah and uh, Barura is usually defined by uh, people, huh? defined by situation and by people. For example, um, you are caught up in a situation where, let's say somebody uh, is traveling abroad huh? and uh, you carry your money with you and you are going for uh, a life, you are going for treatment, then suddenly when you reach the hospital, they say, no, uh, we don't accept cash, we don't accept this, and you do not have prior knowledge to what the situation is, and you are not in a difficulty, you have to, you know, deal with the payment. So you have somebody who has a credit card, you say, please, can you pay for me, then I will pay you. Huh? They say, so that's the case. And you know, this credit card has an interest element, but you are forced by circumstances of something where you had no prior knowledge. But for you to know that, oh, you know, this deposit has interest. And if I take this housing loan, it has interest. And unfortunately, also, many of us will speak it very freely. Uh, Muslims like to speak it freely, even in a lot of countries that I visit. Uh, and the interest rate is very low. Uh, it is not, what can we do? We just need to own a house. No, you don't need to own a house. It's a hider. You can rent a house and live in that house. So Barura must be something which is life-threatening or something which is really very, very critical, you are pushed to a corner, you have no choice. But if you have a choice and you consider Barura, then it's not Barura. Uh, and believe me or not, many people through their heart, that's why the Prophet says, was stuffed the Salba. Deep inside them, Wallahi, they will know whether it's Barura or not. They will know it. Allah gives a guidance for them to know it's a Barura or not. They will know it. And this is different from what we call Siyasa Sharia. Micro and macro is different. For example, for a macro perspective, uh, which you have things dealing with government issues, uh, cross borders issues, these are different discussions under Siyasa Sharia. But here we are focusing on an individual case. Yes. <laughs> okay, bro, we have um, more questions uh, on the chat, bro. I will uh, forward it to you. Well, okay. the next session you can you can highlight it okay. we give you more time for closing remark the first class take, uh, take okay, uh, three good. four minutes uh, for final remarks yeah. okay good okay. Yeah. yeah i could see mashallah so many so many questions i'll try to <laughs> give you later in the next class I'll answer them. yes exactly so um i just uh, my concluding remark to uh, the uh, people participating in this class is first i would like to thank them uh, for sharing their views and thoughts. And uh, normally these uh, introductory classes is just an opening class. 
And uh, within the seven weeks, inshallah, a lot of the issues that I have seen raised will actually be answered in a lot of our discussion on those transactions. And uh, what I can tell the majority of you is that you see, we cannot take al in isolation from al aqidah and from al akhla And because of the way we behave, uh, we tend to lose a lot of sight of our aqidah. And believe me or not, all our practices are related to our aqidah and our akhla If you do your mu'amalat properly, you will find that your level of iman aqidah increases your relationship to Allah becomes very strong. You find also your akhlaq improves. That means your level of kindness, your level of humility, your level of caring also improves. But if your mu'amalat is not really good, then you find it also impacts your other two aspects. You find your iman decreasing and you go more and more into doing bad things. And you find your akhlaq is also affected you start becoming greedy, you start losing that caring attitude, you become arrogant, and a lot of things really impact. So my humble submission to everybody is that all this has to be taken into package because Islam is a package. Uh, we have to take Islam as a package without isolating one part from the other, at least for the Muslims. And inshallah, we'll com uh, complete our discussion in the next class, where we'll be looking at those contractual relationships into detail. Wa jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, everyone is asking for the slide. It's very nice, very simple, yes, yes. <laughs> very easy to understand. It's, uh, exactly. Forward. So how do I... Uh, please forward to I, me. I, forward to me okay, and good. I'll uh, email to everyone, inshallah. Inshallah, I'll forward to you just immediately now. Inshallah. I'll forward to your WhatsApp group, inshallah. Thank you, brother.